All right. Well, it's 730, folks, so um, I think I'll get this show on the road. Uh, welcome to the second time the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club has done a virtual meeting. Uh, this month, we'll have a number of the folks involved with the uh, projects up in Como. Uh, hold on. There we go. Uh, accidentally left one of the streaming options on. Um, but first, uh, a few ground rules. One, to avoid utter chaos, I've got it set so everybody's muted. That way, you know, we won't get random people unmuting. And because there's such a, a large number of guests tonight and a large number of presenters, we're going to sort of go on the honor system because I'm going to have to unmute a number of people at once. And uh, I need you to, if you're not one of the presenters and you're not talking, please just stay muted. I can't be switching on and off people that, that frequently. Uh, secondly, um, for those people on the Zoom meeting and not on the YouTube simulcast that we're trying tonight, um, there's a chat function. If there's something that you need to get my attention about, just send me a, a quick text message through the chat function, and I'll do what I can to get it fixed. But uh, with that said, I'm going to hand control over to Denny, uh, our club president, and he and Dave, our VP, will uh, – go through a couple of news items and just upcoming events and such. There you go. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second uh, video meeting. I was just uh, looking here at the picture of Como and thinking about the, in the 1880s, and here we are in the uh, 2020 uh, on, uh, on a web taking a, a picture um, from uh, from up in the mountains and the technology and how it's changed a little bit different from a telegraph for sure. So uh, this has been a bit of a challenge, but I think it's been wonderful for us to uh, be able to uh, have some presentations um, on video that uh, allow some of our members out of state to, uh, to join us. So welcome, um, I've got uh, some of the the um, names up and depending how the pads are showing up and the pictures, uh, some of you I know and some of you I don't know, but uh, welcome. Uh, the club since 1938 has been meeting and uh, unlike some of the other things with COVID, we've continued to meet every month and, uh, and uh, held true to our tradition of continuing to advance uh, railroad history, hopefully. Um, we, uh, Dave and I, were at uh, the Colorado Railroad M Road Museum July 31st and 1st, and we received this plaque, which is hard to see, but anyway, it's a plaque for the contributions that the club has given, uh, not only um, the club uh, funds, but also the locomotive itself to restore number 20. And we were able to uh, to ride on that, and, and um, they uh, did, a, I think, a nice job in recognizing the club and certainly some of the members that are departed that put a lot of work in uh, 20 from, from the time it was in Alamosa. It's hard to believe abandonment from the uh, Rio Grande Southern and the club bought it and, and, uh, and it steamed up again and was pulling cars. So I don't know if you uh, are in the area and you haven't had a chance to go out to the museum and see it. It's, uh, it's really worthwhile. They've done an awesome job and it just, those old uh, consolidateds and um, and ten wheelers, when they're rebuilt, they still run like a like a jewel. And this one has certainly been uh, been in in that uh, um, venue. And I think it was only 1.4 million, so it's a uh, it is a gem only that's been produced. So <laughs> anyway, I'm going to turn this over to Dave, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of upcoming programs. And um, Dave, you want to? Chat for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Just following along on the, uh, I'm I'm Dave Schaff, the vice president. For those of you that don't see us all the time, we're so used to talking to our little crowd. And I see somebody waving. I guess that means you guys can hear us, so that's a good sign. So uh, hopefully Nathan will let us know if we're too quiet, too loud, any of that. Um, for those of you guys that have not been to one of our meetings, typically we we go around the room and we would introduce people that hadn't been there before, but that kind of doesn't work for this. 
And sometimes we have little uh, tidbits of upcoming news, which is a little bit harder to do in this format. But uh, uh, along with what Denny said with the Rio Grande Southern number 20, just back in the background phase of that, the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club bought it at a court ordered uh, sale in 1952 from the Rio Grande Southern. Uh, locomotive number 20 had been appraised by the court's uh, appraiser at $1,300. But the Rocky Club ended up bidding 2000 because they knew that Knott's Berry Farm was sniffing around trying to pick up uh, a lot of that uh, Colorado narrow gauge at the time. And the club also bought the Rico business car at about the same time. We are working to, uh, when the schedule fits for the Rocky, for the Colorado Railroad Museum, hopefully have some sort of a Rocky Mountain Railroad Club day or part of a day out at the museum where they can run the engine and maybe the Rico car for us might not happen till spring because they're pretty busy this fall. They've got the Thomas event coming up in September. Then they go into the, uh, um, polar. yeah, polar express. And then, and then all of their people are pretty tired by the end of the year. So we will see if in the spring we can do that. And then hopefully less of us will have to be wearing these masks and maybe that'll work out better for, uh, for an event for the railroad club. Um, in other news, um, I stopped by, I happened to be uh, up near Granby uh, a week or two ago and stopped in at the uh, Moffat Road Railroad Museum, which is uh, run by a fellow named Dave Naples. And uh, ho hopefully, I, hopefully you guys still have me. We had a momentary power blank there. Uh, anyway, uh, they've got a Denver and Salt Lake uh, derrick uh, that originally was a steam derrick. Uh, and that was uh, moved there a couple of years ago and they're, they're slowly expanding their museum grounds. They've got a little uh, gift shop and museum building now uh, that formerly was the wedding chapel at Heritage Square, west of Denver, south of Golden. Uh, they also have a, a fairly large enclosed O-scale model railroad layout, which is real popular around Christmas time. Um, another thing that I happen to see, I was reading on the internet today, um, over in the Ogden area of Utah, uh, Denver, Denver and Rio Grande Western number 223, they thought that was going to get restored over the last several years. And there's been some political hangups with various cities and the state getting involved there. And now I believe most of the volunteers that were working on it got locked out of the Ogden Depot where they had been working on it. And I think now they've donated a lot of their tools to the Coombers and Toltec. I think, uh, I read that John Bush from the Coombers and Toltec was there recently and picked up a maybe a truck and trailer load full of stuff. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen with that locomotive. Um, I hope that they end up eventually sending it someplace where it could get put back together and run. There was a tentative plan to maybe have the Coombers and Toltec work on it. Who knows what the actual ownership would be, but all of this is kind of in limbo right now. Uh, so I don't want to hold up the South Park guys too much. Uh, just to let you know, our September program will be uh, presented by Justin France from uh, Montana. He is now uh, associated with Rail Fan and Railroad Magazine, and he will do a program for us next month about uh, former great, uh, great Northern trackage in uh, Northwest Montana. Um, I think this is probably a good time for us to move on, uh, Nathan, to uh, Bob Shoppy and the, the South Park folks. Welcome to the South uh, Park, folks. Dave, did you or Denny want to mention anything about uh, no banquet this year? Oh yeah, we probably should. We well, had we had put that in the newsletter, but yeah, it's probably good to mention that again. There is uh, not going to be a banquet this year just because logistics and a lot of people uh, leery of gathering in groups and maybe tough to find a venue and and that type of thing too. So. Yeah, and quickly, I'd like to say uh, we've also had great success with the uh, the e uh, newsletter, and and we appreciate everybody that signs up for that. That uh, makes faster delivery and um, helps the club, I think, put stuff together. So we'll continue to to publish an analog uh, rail report, but uh, the color uh, um, rail uh, report over the internet, I think, is a, is a modernization movement that's been really good. And I, uh, thank everybody who's been involved in that. So, 
for those of you that aren't members, what he's talking about is uh, we have put out for years a monthly newsletter, uh, typically on paper in black and white, but we have just started offering it to our members as a color version online. Uh, for people that still want the printed version, it will still come in black and white. So we've, we've sort of developed a choice. Um, that's one of the advantages to being a member. For those of you that are just kind of, kind of watching, you know, we get, uh, you get a newsletter, you get discounts at uh, the Colorado Railroad Museum. You would hear about uh, excursions that we do first and or tours that we're sometimes able to do. So try to keep ourselves uh, uh, viable. And, and still something you would like to join since our club has been around since 1938. I think, I think that's about enough for now, uh, Nathan. Nathan is being our, our kind uh, technical director and, and keeping us all together electronically here. All right, guys. Um, all right, Bob, I'll unmute you there. Denny, you're back on mute. Um, I see there's a lot of folks involved in Como on tonight. I want to thank you all. The Brannigans are here. Um, I saw Tim Bain earlier, um, a few others, Pat, um, if any of you want to be unmuted, just, uh, either send me a, a chat message or, or something. No, Dave, I'm not unmuting you. <laughs> um, Bob, you should be on. Can you hear me? Test, test. Yep. We can hear you. All right, should I begin share screen? Uh, let me hand over control of the meeting to you. All right, your host now. Okay, Nathan, is the first slide up? Is it working? It is. You've got a little bit of a gray bar at the top. Have you got something? I'm not sure how to make that go away. Um, On my screen, it's uh, only blocking a little tiny bit. It's just a little annoyance, but there it goes. It just disappeared from my screen. Do you have a clean picture, Nathan? Yeah, picture's clean. Go for it. Okay. I'll welcome everybody uh, to the Como Railroad Project 2020. We did a presentation last May at the church for the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club, and I'd like to thank the board of directors and all the members for asking us to make this presentation. We're certainly proud of the Como Railroad Project, and we sure like to talk about it. We're coming to you live from right in the middle of Radio Free Colorado, downtown, beautiful Como. And I'm actually in the hotel and that's not for nostalgia. David has a much better internet connection than I do. This next little thing you're gonna see is a little ditty that's on our website. One of our members put this together. I hope it comes through okay on your end. talk a little bit about the past, uh, mostly on the present. While I'm on the present, uh, we'll show some historical slides that refer to whatever it is we're talking about at the present. And at the end, a little bit about the future plans for Como. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club Historical Foundation for the grants you've awarded us. A lot of the progress you'll see in this presentation came from your help. It's primarily done by two 501c3 nonprofits, the Denver South Park and Pacific Historical Society and the South Park Rail Society. In addition to many volunteers, uh, Tom Lawson, one of our board members, runs the volunteer group. And I believe he's got a, a list of about 50 to 60 people. And on any given day, we typically have 20 to 25 people. And uh, a lot of donations, uh, a lot of other groups we've received grants from. There are so many partners in this to make all this possible. I'm going to start with a little bit of the history. This is the oldest known photograph of Como taken by George Mellon in 1883. And I hope you can see my mouse. That's going to be my laser pointer. Here's the original hotel. It was called the Gilman Hotel. 
that was opened January 1st, 1881. And then the next year they built this extension and you can see in those days, the hotel was connected to the depot. Over here, we have the only two years old at this point, uh, roundhouse and the original tank that had a peak roof with a stone base. Back here is the tenement building. The foundation of it is still there today. And I didn't bother blowing this up, but this is a very rare photograph of a Mason Bogey 286. Over here is a 266. And I want to show you a close up of the hotel. This is from the same picture. Uh, when the Gilman was built, it had this nice porch here, a walkout porch. This middle opening here was a door that was later turned into a window and they built this extension that for several years looked very unfinished. And here's the 1879 depot. And I'm not sure when, but probably a year or two later, they put this addition in. You can see a new roof and it was connected to the hotel. In 1885, the Pacific Hotel Company came along working in conjunction with the Union Pacific, kind of a smaller version of the Fred Harvey House arrangement with Santa Fe. And they took over the property, did away with a little porch that was here and turned that door into a window and put a nice porch all the way across the building finished the roof and chimneys up here and put in a nice dormer. And interestingly, the depot was moved about 15 feet to the south and now there was a gap between these two buildings. We can only surmise why they did this. My guess is they thought if the wooden depot ever caught fire, it might hurt the brick hotel. When ironically, the opposite is what happened. In November of 1896, a kitchen fire, and you can see the stove right there started and burned the Pacific Hotel to the ground and miraculously the depot survived. The following year in 1897, they built today's hotel and they started at this corner and went out from there along this wall. These window remnants are still there today, but they're bricked up, but it only went out to about here. It was a little bit smaller and down to about here. It wasn't quite as long either. This next photo, uh, Todd Hackett put it together and it's kind of a then now as it fades back and forth. This is the hotel as it looked brand new in 1897 and the now photo was actually taken about 10 years ago. You can see some brick over here in the then photo. It's probably debris from the fire. They hadn't finished cleaning it up yet. And there's some stoves on the porch. Uh, it's probably not even fully operational yet, but, and there's a depot off to the side there. Fast forward to the end of an era, April 10th, 1937. This is a very famous photograph. I believe it's a Richard B. Jackson photograph. But this was the last scheduled train, a passenger train from Leadville through Como and then down to Denver. The next day on the 11th was the last scheduled freight train and that was the end of operations. There were some equipment movements later that year. And of course the following year, 1938, the track was torn up. Here's a Forest Service aerial photo, I guess the 1938 version of a satellite photo. Here's the roundhouse, the turntable, the tenement building, the coal dock was still there. And up here is the depot and the hotel. Another famous photograph, this is from the mid 1880s. Um, shows the stone roundhouse before the wooden additions were built. And in the late 1880s and early 1890s, 13 more stalls were added and it came around almost to the point where the photographer is in this photo, more than half of a circle. Those were taken down in 1923 and they built three uh, or modified three existing uh, wooden stalls for the uh, rotary and uh, two of the other tracks were just pass-throughs. But there were three more stalls and they burned down at 35, but they did rebuild them and they lasted till 38. Uh, today's turntable restoration looks just like this with the push bars and the wooden deck. One interesting feature are the locomotive headlights on the corner of the roundhouse. You can't see this one because it's blocked by the locomotive, but that was their night illumination and we, we do hope to recreate that effect. Here's a nice model of the Como roundhouse and this is probably very realistic what it probably looked like back in the day. You can see back here is the boiler room that powered a steam engine that powered the pulleys and the cables and the belts not cables, but the pulleys and the belts that ran all the machinery that was in the roundhouse. The drill presses and the lathes and those sorts of things. Note the wooden floor, and that shows up in some photographs we have of the interior of the roundhouse. And today there's a few segments of the original flooring that we hope to incorporate. Uh, one day we do plan to 
re-establish the wood floor in, in the roundhouse. At the moment, we've got stone there as kind of an interim uh, step, and we'll show you pictures of that later. And here's what Bill Kazel and his son Greg and others started with. And in fact, this is a July 1959 photograph. Oops. And it was in pretty sad shape. And they didn't get started on it till the mid 80s. And it was even more deteriorated by then. A lot of these doors were falling down. The stonework needed uh, repair. And pretty much all of the windows were busted out. And this is the interior back in those days. The ceiling is collapsing. The roof is really caving in all over the place. There's cows wandering in and out. And I don't know why this thing is advancing when I don't want it to. And there's some horses over here. And you can see it was just a mess. After it was abandoned in 1938, the Cooley brothers took it over and they actually uh, put a sawmill in there. Here's some uh, Bill Kazel photographs when they took down what was left of the roof before they put up a new one. And this is really cool. This is Bill's office, quarters, whatever you want to call it. I like his attitude, the way he painted that. Wouldn't it be cool to have that today? We could put trucks on it, put it on the track and call it a CNS work car. Fast forward to 2008, uh, Dr. Charles Brannigan, Chuck Brannigan and his wife, Kathy, acquired the property. I think it was in 2002. Kathy, if I guessed wrong on that, I apologize, but I know that's close. And Bill acquired this turntable and put it in the pit. It is a 50 foot turntable. We're not sure of its origins. It may even be an original Como turntable. There were two of them over the years, uh, but it sat in this pit for about 25 years. And if you'll note uh, how deteriorated the, where the ring rail used to be, this uh, cement that's there, and there used to be large wooden pieces of ties, I think. And the dirt has filled it up almost to that level I'll compare that to the next photo. Oops, two photos from now. This is the turntable bearing that we acquired, kind of a small miracle. It came from a DNRG turntable on the end of a spur out near Paonia. It's about four feet across in this picture. Of course, the top is missing, but it just operates on tapered Timken roller bearings that we cleaned up and greased and then it works just great now. It's very easy to turn the turntable. Here it is restored in 2018, just two years ago. Note the new concrete and the new wood and the new ring rail and how much uh, dirt is now been taken out. Um, it had really filled up with dirt and weeds over the years, but this is the original level. Over here in stall six is our speeder. Klondike Kate is residing in stall number five. Uh, just last year, we finished restoring uh, the pit inspection pit in stall number three. Originally, all six stalls had one of these inspection pits. Uh, number six has also been dug out. It's not really functional at the moment because half of it is under the tool room and the other half just has some very light rail on it. At the moment, we're storing the speeder and the hand car on that. But this was rebuilt properly. And at the moment, Klondike Kate is sitting on this. And I'll show you a picture of that in a bit here. Or a very little bit. There it is. That was backed into there in May uh, for some much needed maintenance. Uh, the pits are not very deep, I think about 30 inches or so, but it sure makes it easier to get underneath it. Uh, in the interim, before we get around to finishing the wood floor, uh, stone has been put in here and it, it's really quite the improvement. We had just put it down and we're still spreading it out here. And it keeps the dust down, and certainly looks a lot better. Going over to the depot, this is the famous before and after photo. This photo was taken in May of 2008. Uh, the following month in June, we started the first steps in stabilizing it because it was not far from falling down. The front had sunk two feet, half of the tin roof was gone, all the windows were gone. And the Cooley brothers had turned it into a garage where the freight door used to be and is again. Uh, but it was a two car garage and over here was a one car garage. So you could put three vehicles in there. And this is in August of 2015 when we finished it and dedicated it on Boreas Pass Railroad Day. This is an interesting interim shot. Uh, this would be about 2010, maybe 11, I'm not sure. Uh, you see the original nailers here and the ones that had to be replaced, the new wood here. Now the building was built with a wood shingle roof. 
And around 1900, the railroad put this corrugated tin on there. And again, from that prior photo, you saw that half of it was missing. So in May or June of 2008, when we stabilized the building, we put matching corrugated tin. Of course, it's brand new. And a couple of years later, um, we got another grant and the roofer was working his way over, removing the tin and putting in the wood shingles. And the chimneys had been restored. The wind had eroded the mortar between the bricks and it pretty much had taken the bricks uh, down to the roof line or just inside the roof line. And all the bricks were on the ground on the front and back. Uh, another interesting thing is when we took the windbreak away, the original colors showed up, or at least the Burlington colors. These weren't the very first colors, but when the Burlington took over the CNS, they used this uh, shade of dark red and dark green. And you can see a little bit more up under the eaves here where the sun didn't quite finish it off. Another before and after the ticket window in 2008, and again in 2015. Mike Perschbacher and his crew of Older Than Dirt Construction worked the magic on this. They also did the Buena Vista Depot, and they also did Boxcar 608, which we'll get into later. The cross bucks were the first thing we restored, and these are the original boards that you see here. Boris Pass Railroad Day, this is our signature event each year. Unfortunately, it was going to be this Saturday, but of course the virus has changed everything and now it'll be August 21st of next year. We feature hand car rides and uh, this was really popular. There was quite a long line for this. In the background here is XRGS 256. Here's Kathy and Chuck Brannigan, the hosts. They founded the Denver Brass, and to me, this is the highlight. As much as I love Klondike Kate and the track and everything else, this is the highlight, the concert. The Denver Brass performs at two o'clock, along with, accompanied by, the Celtic Colorado bagpipers and drums. And the first year, they performed two concerts. One was in front of the depot, which was a historical setting. You'll see that photograph in a moment. And they did another one in the turntable pit. And of course the punchline there was that became the orchestra pit. But in 2018, uh, the weather wasn't cooperating at all. It was cold and windy. So they did an emergency retreat inside the roundhouse and the acoustics turned out to be fantastic. And they decided to never worry about the weather again. We're just gonna do it in here every year from now on. This next slide I'm gonna show, it's two minutes of one of the uh, numbers or arrangements that they did. And when we tested this a few days ago, some of the guys weren't getting it very well. I guess it depends on the quality of your internet connection, but um, if, if yours is good, you'll enjoy this. It's about two minutes long. And if you don't get a good connection, uh, the pain and suffering will only last for two minutes. <laughs>
Anyway, uh, that concert is incredible. Whatever sound system you're listening to doesn't do it justice. It's at 2 o'clock, third Saturday of August next year, and uh, it's free, and it, it's incredible. It, even if you don't care much about Como Railroads, come and see the concert. This is a, a reproduction that Pat Morrow put together Oops. and uh, of the bass drum from the original Como band, which you'll see here. This is circa 1900, uh, mostly kids, but this is right in front of the uh, freight door of the depot. And this is where the Denver Brass did their very first concert a few years ago. This was last year, I, I call this the uh, modeling the steam to diesel transition era in 2019 in one to one scale. In the background here, you can see the back of the depot and there's the hotel. This is Plymouth Diesel number five, a 12 tonner that we acquired and we had high hopes for it. It, it ran well, it was uh, interesting how to start. It was a two stage process, but the gentleman who leased it to us, unfortunately uh, passed away and his son had different ideas and we couldn't make a deal that would work for both of us. So it disappeared this May. And in its place is not the world's most beautiful diesel locomotive. And despite its, its size, it looks kind of smaller than the 12 tonner, but this is actually a 20 ton Plymouth diesel. That's the replacement. It came to us from the Sumter Valley. And we're here we are using uh, diesel number five, Plymouth number five to push it into stall number five, where uh, uh, Jeff is gonna work on it. You can see we put Kate over here in stall number three above the pit. And we've removed the bodywork and this ancient Climax engine. We didn't know anything about the engine other than it was missing most of its pieces. And we were going to replace that with another power plant you'll see in a moment. But of course, here's the star of the show. This is a great uh, portrait on the turntable, Klondike Kate. And here she is in her full glory, a little too much glory. The steam chests are leaking a little bit, but we're working on that too. Of course, nobody was interested. And this is an interesting shot. Bob or Bill Brown of the Colorado River Museum Board of Directors uh, made this Red Hill Station replica sign based on the original that they have there. And he even uh, came up with these simulated boiler tubes that were flattened out. Old boiler tubes were flattened out on one end and often used for station signs. The real Red Hill Station was about three track miles down here off the Gunnison, Maine. And we decided to put it here. This is Jason Midyet and Tom Lawson, probably because Jason had just, finishing, had just finished painting this uh, DNRG drop bottom gun, along with the trucks and the rail and the ties and part of the hillside here and even his pants. So at that point, it just seemed like the natural place to put a Red Hill sign. We also had a Model T uh, running around the property last year. That's very prophetic because of the history of the South Park Zephyr, which we'll talk more about later. And this was the morning uh, of last year on Main Street where some of the vendors were setting up. And occasionally we break out the speeder and take folks for a ride. And this is an interesting history here. Uh, this speeder was made in 1952 by the Fairmont Company and it was built originally for the Tacoma power plant on the DNS. If you've ever ridden that train, and I'll bet all of you have, you go right past it. This is Tom Van Dusen working one of the original Fair Play Flume printing presses by hand. And this is always a popular feature. We have two of their printing presses. They've been in a roundhouse for many years, but recently we moved them. Here's Bob Revis and his big John Deere backhoe moving the other one. And this one weighs about 8,000 pounds. It was a lot of iron in that thing. And now they're over in the garages uh, by the old Allen Saloon or Coma Mercantile. And again, on Boys Pass Railroad Day, we open that garage and, and Tom will do his thing again. Uh, if you've ever roamed around the grounds around the roundhouse, you may have noticed this. It was kind of hiding in the weeds for many, many decades and Jason took it home. Uh, we pulled all the sticker bushes out of it and a lot of the wood was rotten. He restored it and brought it back to Como. This was a big day. Rocky Mountain Railroad Club chartered the train and brought their world famous drum head here. Boy, if that thing could only talk, huh? 
And here it is on some new mileage. I think if I'm not mistaken, this was the first time it had been on South Park track. CNS 8027, when the CNS was formed in 1899, uh, they ended up acquiring three different groups of boxcars that we refer to today as type one, two, and three. This is a type one. And as far as we know, it's the only remaining example of a type one. And Jason found this on a lawn in Boulder and it didn't look anything like this. He restored it. It was pretty sad looking. He wasn't even sure what it was. He knocked on the door. They let him look at it. He found out what it was, made a deal, took it home and restored it very nicely. It still needs a little bit, some couplers, uh, but it's beautiful to look at. And again, as far as we know, it's the only one left. Here's a type three, 8311. Here it is up on Boreas Pass for not very much longer. We made a deal with the uh, Forest Service office in Fairplay. And they asked us if we would help them repaint this. They've got their hands full with other things and this year of budget cuts, they don't have much money. In fact, the section house that was restored by them many years ago is in need of a lot of work. Some of the logs on the bottom are rotting away. So that's the main thing on the radar. And they asked us if we would help them. And we said, suggested, hey, how about if we bring it down to Como and work on it? And uh, they agreed to that. So we're gonna restore it down in Como. This has an interesting history. Um, I don't know if any of you are aware, but. It was a flat car for a while on the White Pass in Yukon. They took the box off it and turned it into a flat car. It was an idler for their uh, crane. And then it uh, was bought by Dan Quiet. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And he brought it back down to Colorado. It was in Central City briefly. And uh, he sent it to Ulrich Locomotive Works out there in Strasburg. And they rebuilt the box on this one. And the other one that's in Breckenridge today, I think that's 8329. They're both type threes with a steel underframe. Um, the box is in amazingly good condition despite the weathered appearance. And you'll see evidence of that in a moment. We moved to June 17th and uh, one of our volunteers, Bob Revis with his John Deere backhoe came up and threw some dirt over here because it was a kind of an angled grade here. And we wanted to be able to get a, a trailer into here to load up the box car. Here's Bob unwelding it from the track. It had literally been welded to the rail. And SD Trucking, they're our go-to people for moving locomotives and cars, uh, ties, rail, everything. And it stands for Steve Disher Trucking. This is his brother, John Disher, who came up. And this is amazing. These guys can do this in their sleep. I was wondering how he would get the trailer in there. I thought it might take several attempts. His first attempt at this jackknife maneuver lined up the rails on his trailer perfectly. And this is one of those trailers, uh, there's a name for it, I don't recall, but it's like a rollback truck that they put cars up on. It's got a bogey of three axles underneath it that can move back and forth. And the trailer tilts up and rolls back. So he was able to lower it down to the track level and he winched the box car up onto it, tied it down, and he's getting ready to take it down to Como. And this was quite a sight. Bob Revis picked up the uh, access platform to the box car and a frog that was laying there on the back of this. And he drove 10 miles from Boreas down to Como in this arrangement. That was quite a sight, but not as much of a sight as this. So here's CNS 8311, completing a long, long journey as the last CNS car of any kind to go over Boreas Pass. I believe it went up there in July of 1998 and paused briefly for about 22 years and then finished the, the trek down to Como. And here it is in Como later that day, holding court along with 8027 in the Como yard. This is the builder's plate that Ulrich put inside of it. It says built 1909, rebuilt July 21st, 1997. And here's a picture of the underneath of it. You can see even despite 22 years up on Boreas Pass, which faded the heck out of the paint, but all the wood is intact and it didn't even really weather down here below. Boxcar 608. This is quite an amazing story too. This was built by Litchfield Car and Machinery Company in Litchfield, Illinois. Uh, the South Park ordered, I forget if it was 150 or 180 boxcars in one order, and they were delivered in 1879 and 1880, numbered from 600 up. So this was 608. It was probably one of the first ones delivered, probably in 1879. 
And in the 1890s, uh, it went to another Union Pacific controlled railroad. Jason, correct me if I got this wrong, but I think it went to the line out of Boulder that went up to Empire and Ward uh, and Sunset. There was the Greeley, Salt Lake and Pacific, I believe, which eventually became Colorado and Northwestern. When they were done with it, they put it on the ground for a while as a kind of a workshed. And then after they were done with it, it ended up on private property just outside of Cardinal, which is just west of uh, Netherland. Here's a picture of its sister car, 609. This is a William Henry Jackson photograph, a close up of a cabinet car with a short train in uh, Chalk Creek Canyon. So, this is what it'll look like when it's restored. You can see it had the little lumber door in the end, which many of the early box cars had, and it had wooden ladders. And we got Mike Perschbacher, who worked his magic on the Como Depot and again the Buena Vista Depot, along with a lot of other historic buildings. He's done a lot of work in St. Elmo lately. And Mike was really trying to retire. I don't know if he's succeeded yet or not, but the world keeps bugging him because his work is so good. And when I asked him if he would do Boxcar 608, I could see the pause and he was thinking, man, driving up to Como every day. And I said, Mike, how about if we bring it to you? And that turned the trick that, that got him. So we hauled it down to his house in Canyon City and put it on his front lawn and he picked at it between all the other jobs. And this was last September when it was returning to Como. This is Highway 9, just crossing from Teller County into Gar County. I couldn't resist taking this picture. There it is being unloaded in Como. And you'll notice that this end is not restored. And we talked about this at length and we came up with a compromise. We decided to restore one side and the other end and the other side in this end, we left unrestored. All we did was replace any missing boards because a lot of the boards along the bottom, as you can see here, had to be replaced uh, as they had rotted out from sitting on the ground. And this is Susan Livingston, who has a particularly acute interest in this car. And that is because her and her husband, Don, lived in this car for two years when it was up in Cardinal. Here's the other side. And Mike wanted to save all the original wood that he could, and we certainly supported that. He did the same thing with the Como Depot. So all the boards that were rotten, he cut them up to where the wood could be saved and replaced each and every piece. But a lot of the reason we decided to do it this way was to save the original 1879 applied DSP and PRR. We didn't want to lose that. You can see the patch that was put over it. The patch faded and the original white DSP and P started to emerge again. And it did not fade because at some point the car was covered with asphalt roofing shingles and that's what preserved what was underneath. In fact, while Mike was restoring this, he had a, a piece of plywood covering this so the sun wouldn't fade it anymore. At the other end, part of the 608 is still there. Part of it was lost because they put a window in down here at this end. And again, here, this window, we left it alone, but you can still see the original rail for the little sliding door to load lumber. There's the bracket, the stop bracket. And here it is for its official portrait. Uh, we haven't lettered it yet, that'll be done soon. And we'll letter it just like you saw that picture of 609, but just on the one end and the one side. Another project we're working on is DNRG stock car 5743. Uh, this came from a siding on the DNS. And it's actually in better shape than it looks. Uh, the frame is in good shape and the body's in pretty good shape. It'll need a few boards replaced. The floor needs to be replaced and the roof needs to be replaced. And this is uh, one of many excursions organized by Tom Lawson. He's our volunteer czar. There's Pat Morrow. Another one of our heroes is Nick Ralston right here. He's a, a lineman for the BNS, BNSF. And Tom has worked with uh, a lot of people in the chain of command at BNSF and including Nick here uh, to get his permission when they do uh, maintenance, tire replacement, or in this case, they were realigning a siding. You can see the concrete ties are getting ready to put in. And they said, come and get them. So uh, we got Steve Disher, who's right here driving his truck. And we acquired over 200 ties that day. And Nick even helped us out immensely with just the hydraulic spiker. Um, if you've ever driven spikes by hand or pulled them out by hand, that's excruciatingly brutal hard work. 
and we wouldn't have gotten nearly as many ties without Nick and his hydraulic spiker that would just quietly suck out the spikes and drop them down. And oh man, the military would call this a force multiplier. It certainly was. And this is the result, loading up the ties and we're not done yet. There's more on this truck and they would end up in Como. We've probably done, I don't know, Tom will have to correct me on this, four or five, maybe even six. And there's more coming. Tom's eyeballing more piles of ties and working deals with the BNSF and we'll get more ties in the future. If you have ties, you need rail. We were very fortunate to acquire a lot of rail from Breckenridge. Uh, you guys may remember the famous sundown and Southern auction many years ago. The town of Breckenridge acquired almost all of the rail they had there, along with barrels of joiners and bolts and spikes. And they were going to build some kind of touristy operation, but it never came to fruition. So for decades, this track sat in the weeds, so just off Highway 9 north of Breckenridge. In 2015, we approached them and asked for just six pieces to put as a decoration in front of the depot when we uh, christened it, basically, or dedicated it in August of 2015. And even then, we didn't realize that just two years later, we'd be laying track like crazy and uh, because we had a steam engine that wanted to run. So we went back and asked them, can we have more? And they said, well, how much? And I said, well, all of it. And they actually went for it. So it took several trips and a couple of years, but we probably brought six or seven uh, semi loads of rail to, to Como. And this is what you do with it. We've got a spiker now. Uh, for the first couple of years, we were doing all the spikes by hand. And again, that, that's really hard work. And, and this thing is just a, a great time saver and, and muscle saver. Uh, this is track 10 over here, the turntable lead. And this is track 11 we're putting in, which will join back with 10 in the switch up here. This is the CNS standard gauge box car that Jason brought, and that's our tool car today. And there's the depot in the hotel. Uh, the pneumatic spiker, and here's a couple second clip of it in action. That is a sweet sound. Here we are in track 11, doing our best to lay 30 inch gauge rail. And somebody finally realized, hey, we got to move this rail over. And eventually we got it right. And now it's 36 inch gauge. We were renting a uh, air compressor for a while when we first got the spiker. And now we have our own air compressor that was donated to us. And this is one of the tracks on the south side of the turntable. Again, there's XRGS 256. Jason's running the show. We've got the switch started between tracks 11 and track 10. Uh, we need to get some more switch pieces. We hope to finish this this year. Gondola 4319. Uh, this used to give rides in Central City when they actually had a steam operation there for a while. You can see they put some uh, hinges here and cut the, the boards and made a gate. And so this was a rider gone for a while. And uh, then it sat in this park about two miles outside of Central City for 40 some years. And again, this is what the weather does to it when you don't, don't keep it up. Uh, it's pretty darn intact. It's almost all there. There's a few pieces missing. Uh, the knuckles on the cup where somebody grabbed those. But mostly it's there and we're going to restore it. We've got a 10 year lease on it and uh, we're working on it now. And I hope to have it finished by October and repaint it. Uh, these floorboards are out of it now. You'll see that in another photo in a moment. They weren't the original floorboards, but they were rotten. Here it is being unloaded in, in Como. There's Tim Bain and Jason. And here's Jason gently massaging one of the replacement boards into place. And here's Jason photographing normally unseen details of the frame after we took the old rotten floorboards out. And uh, we'll be replacing those probably in the next few days. Last November, we acquired a set of Bettendorf trucks. And these are original CNS trucks. There's two different stock car numbers painted on these trucks. But they were definitely CNS. Uh, we received a nice donation of a couple of display cabinets. They'll go into the store inside the roundhouse. In the background, you can see some reproduction uh, locomotive headlights that one of our members, Phil Carney, put together a couple years ago. 
we're going to use two of those on the outside of the roundhouse like we saw in that 1880s photograph to replicate the night illumination. And the other one will eventually be a backup light on the tender of Klondike Cape. We also received a nice donation of some aluminum benches. They come in handy for the concert. Both societies have a quarterly newsletter. Now, this is ours, uh, the DSPNP Historical Society. It's called Bogies in the Loop. It comes out four times a year. And the South Park Rail Society has their signature publication called the Como Headlight. The name comes from an 1880s newspaper published in Como that was called the Como Headlight. Uh, here's our tool car that Jason put together. And it's based on a historical uh, precedent. Here's a couple of them in this picture right outside of Pat Gibney's car shop. There's the depot and there's the hotel. And there's Jason taking the speeder out for a spin on the Gunnison, Maine. And this is what it's all about, train time at the depot. This was, I believe, the first year because the DSPNP isn't on the tender yet. So this would be 2017. Uh, we have a nice replica of the train order board and it works. All the mechanism goes in and down to here where the handle is. And we received a tremendous gift from Don and Bob Shank. Uh, they donated this original Pacific Express Company uh, freight wagon to us. It dates from the 1870s. Um, the wooden wheels uh, give it away its age and there's a builder's plate on the back. And this, this thing is incredible. This was a precursor to the later REA freight wagons that were far more numerous. Don and Bob said this is the only one that they know of in existence today. Uh, an aerial shot from a drone. This was last year, um, the morning of Boreas Pass Railroad Day. At this point, there were two tracks on the south side of the turntable. The next photo I'll show you is a similar view taken from this year on a rainy day, but you can see the third tracks installed and there was a fourth track. We may get around to putting that one in as well. And there's diesel number five. And this was taken this year. Um, this is the first of two air compressors that were donated to us. This one's not running yet. Uh, it's been many, many years since this one ran. We started work on it. We hope to take the axle off and put it on a cart and uh, a four wheel cart that'll go down the track and be pushed to the end of track to be used for the spiker. And the other one still has the axle on it. You'll see that one in a moment, but that one is running. Uh, recently, we put in a culvert underneath the Boreas track. And some days we actually have three machines running here. Two of them belong to Chris Tome, these Bobcats. And there's Bob Revis in his backhoe, and they're there every volunteer day. And they have moved many, 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 many cubic yards of dirt. When we started this, we were doing shovels and wheelbarrows. And if it wasn't for these guys and those machines, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we're at today. Uh, this was last fall. We were just starting to extend the track up towards the switch here in front of the hotel that would define the Denver Main and the Boreas Main. And both of these were taken this year. This was probably either late May or early June. And you can see the switch is roughed in. Guardrails aren't nailed down yet, but that's the Denver Main going down into the gulfs to cross the trestle up to the Y and down to Jefferson and over Kenosha and on to Denver. And this is the Boreas Pass Main starting out. The next slide I'll show you shows this one again for reference. And this one was taken just the other day. Got a bit more track laid. Uh, it needs a little bit of tweaking, jacking up in a couple places and more ballast put under it, but uh, we'll get to that. Uh, Tom Lawson took this picture the other day. And I'm going to try to name everybody. This was our crew Saturday, the 8th of August, just the other day. This is Jack Currier, Kirk Thode, Bob Revis, Patricia Tamalis, Tim Scoville. Brian Barton, Scott Bollinger, uh, Alex Hoy. Uh, this guy looks familiar. Oh yeah, that's me. And let's see, Scott Barton, Aaron Bollinger, and Gary Patterson. Jeff Ramsey's lurking in the background there. 
not in this picture, where Tom Lawson, who took the picture, and somewhere around there, it's always hard to get everybody in this one shot at any one time. But Chris Tome was there, Steve Schweighoffer, uh, Zane Lewis, and Michael Bottomley, and, uh, and again, Tom Lawson. But this is what a typical crew looks like on any one of our work days. This is the other end of the track that we've, this is how far we've gotten. We're into the curve and we're not too far from the property line now. We'll take the track out to the property line and we'll probably lay some more track on the Denver main coming down here. Uh, a few uh, parameters here, I guess, or uh, hard numbers. We measured this the other day and track spike down is about 3,700 feet. Using a 30 foot average, it works out to approximately 240 sticks. Weight is about 172,000 pounds or about 86 tons. Uh, at 16 average ties per 30 foot length, that works out to just under 2,000 ties and just under 8,000 spikes. Coming attractions. Future plans, obviously more track, rebuild the trestle, we hope to do that, rebuild the water tank, and we may get started on that next year. We build some roundhouse stalls, hopefully we'll, we'll do three of those and finish the roundhouse floor and there's lots of other little projects. Uh, here's a close up of an ICC map from 1918. And the yellow is existing track, but this was in the spring. Uh, blue is planned future track. We hope to put more radial tracks around the roundhouse the fourth track to the south and extend the Gunnison Main down to the property line, which is somewhere right around here. Actually, we might curve it a little bit because it runs into telephone poles before it runs into the road. Uh, up here's the depot in the hotel. And on this map, the colors show that this is future, but we've already got the Denver Main to about there and the Boreas Main pretty far out now. Backing out on the same map, um, this shows the Denver main. It goes down into Park Gulch, crosses a small trestle, and goes up the other side of the gulch. And this is about where the top is. So it starts heading for Jefferson this way. The tail of this used to go down to the King Coal Mines about two miles down. And uh, today, 285 comes right across the bottom here. And we hope maybe someday to rebuild the trestle and rebuild this Y. If we get that far, that would give us about a one mile run from the far end of the track down here where it goes up against telephone poles and a road and about a one mile run with the ability to turn at least the engine, if not the whole train on the Y. And again, the engine on the turntable down here. So we don't have to back up, we'll always be going forward. And the, uh, the yard here was four track. I don't know if we're gonna get around to building all four we already are planning on the second track in addition to the one that's under construction now. And right now it comes to about here and we're gonna take it to the property line about here. Again, a 1938 Forest Service photo that shows the Denver main across the trestle, climbing up the other side of the gulch and then here's where it levels out and there's the Y. This went down to the King Coal Mines and this went to Jefferson, Kenosha, down the Platte, all the way to Denver and the Boreas Main was along here. There's the hotel and there's the depot, and there's the roundhouse and the turntable. Here's a better visual representation of that. Um, originally, this track was just a spur to the old Lechner coal mine. That was a small coal mine, didn't amount to very much. Very quickly, they discovered there was a lot more coal down here about two miles south at the King Coal Mines. And then in 1881, as the joint operating agreement fell apart, the DSP and P decided to build their own line all the way to Leadville. What they'd done prior to this, of course, was go down to Buena Vista and had the joint operating agreement with the DNRG and use their trackage to get up to Leadville. So then they basically repurposed this old spur and this became the main. There's a switch. Actually, it's just on this side of the road. And then it went up to Boreas Pass, down to Breckenridge, Frisco, up to 10 Mile over Fremont Pass, and all the way down to Leadville. Uh, this is the one air compressor that it hadn't run in many years. We were draining the fluids, replacing the, the uh, filters. Hasn't started yet, but we'll get this one running. And here's the other one uh, that ran, last ran just a few years ago. This one was much easier to get started. And the guy who donated it was Scott Francis and his wife, Jenny. They drove it out here from the Midwest 
And this contraption is a baking soda blaster. And we haven't started on this yet. This needs a lot of work, but if we can get that running, that'll really come in handy for stripping old paint off of cars before we repaint them. That's what he used it for. Here's the uh, 20 ton Plymouth again in better days. Still not very pretty. Here's Jeff Badger, Chief Mechanical Officer in the Georgetown Loop. Having fun playing with this thing. Here's the old Climax engine that is now out of it. This was a propane tank. That's now out of it, and all the old body work is off of it. And here's what it looks like today. And we acquired a much more modern and smaller but more powerful GMC or Jimmy 671 diesel. And the designation means six cylinders, 71 cubic inches per. So it's about a seven liter diesel engine. It's actually smaller but more powerful than the original Climax and parts are a lot more plentiful. Um, this shows a train arriving from Denver or it may actually be backing down to the Y. That's how they got them out of Como. They back it down to the Y, turn it around and then it would head down to Denver. But the reason I showed this picture was I wanted to show the platform. Uh, we hope to restore this soon. The platform has been restored in front of the depot, but it stops at the end of the depot. And originally, it went from just south of the depot all the way to the north end of the hotel. This little building down here was the scale house. There was a, a scale under this part of the track. This shows the Park Gulch trestle. There are very few good photos of that. And on a wintry day, obviously, this engine wasn't going anywhere. It's hot and it looks like it's heading for Denver, but it doesn't look like it's going to get through this. And this train came down from Boreas. I'm not sure if it's stuck or just sitting there. Uh, the next photo will be a close up of the trestle. And this is what we hope to rebuild. As trestles go, it's fairly simple. It is on a curve, but it's only one tier high, five spans over four bends. This is an interesting photo, a lot of detail here. It's a uh, January 1929 photo, one of many commissioned by the Denver Water Board, actually. And there's a whole series of photos that the Colorado Railroad Museum has. And whoever photographed this took pictures all the way from Denver to Leadville. But this is a great shot of the Como Yards. Back here are the two boxcars that are still there today. And there was trackage into each one of them. It was a, basically a garage for hand cars like this one or speeders like this one. And they put uh, French style doors or French doors on each end of it, open it up and they would drive the vehicles right in there and close the doors and work on them. Notice this switch has no moving parts. And there's another one basically underneath this because there was a track into each box car. And we do hope to recreate that. And there's no moving parts because you didn't need to. You could lift one end at a time and put the axle on these rails and then just go down into the garage. Uh, here's a flanger. There's the three bays. One was elongated for the rotary. And there are very few pictures. In fact, I think this is the only one I know of that show both Como water tanks in one photograph. Uh, the next photo I'll show you was a close up of these two. So this was the south tank out on the edge of town. And this is the one right in the yards behind the roundhouse that we hope to recreate. Uh, this wintry photo shows uh, the three bays that were still there at the end. Again, we hope to recreate this one day. And this is our other locomotive that we're working on. Jason Medjet owns this. It's a little five-tonner Plymouth diesel. Uh, or maybe a gas engine, I'm not sure. Uh, Jason, correct me on that when you unmute. Um, it's at his house and he's working on it. Obviously, we're going to repaint it. We'll probably paint it red like everything else, knowing Jason. But uh, the beauty of this thing is it's a light engine. It'll only push one car around at a time, but it'll also fit on the turntable with the one car that it's pushing. Whereas the 20 tonner is too long and too heavy to do that. But that'll come in handy for pulling trains or moving an entire consist at one time. The South Park Zephyr, remember that Model T we saw earlier from last year? Uh, this was built by a few guys in uh, Como in the spring of 1938. It was uh, brothers Claire and Jean Dugan and uh, John Riedesel, if I'm saying that correctly, R-I-E-D-E-S-E-L. He wrote an interesting article on, on the history of this car and how they converted it. And it appeared in a 1985 uh, Model T magazine, basically. I have a copy at home. 
but explains how they did this and why they did it and some of his adventures on the line. They actually drove this all the way up to Fremont Pass, and he mentioned in there that they could not get to the top because the Climax mine tailings were already burying the track, which is interesting because when they started pulling up the track later that year, that means some of it is probably still there under the tailings. I'm sure they didn't dig it up just to pull it up. Uh, but they started that and they came over for his pass, but they were driving this thing back and forth. There's a nice picture of it in front of the Kokomo Depot. They also drove it up the Fair Play Branch all the way to Alma and over Kenosha and down the Platte Canyon. They had a lot of fun with this thing. He talked about one close call they had one night they were driving it down the west side of Boreas, went around a curve and there was a flat car with a brake set and they pushed the radiator into the fan and uh, basically jury rigged it and got it back down the hill. Anyway, the reason we're showing this is because Jeff Badger is recreating it. Now I showed a few of these slides last year. Jeff's still working on it. Uh, there's going to be some modern improvements and he plans to make it basically a uh, Model T golf cart. Um, the four cylinder flathead uh, engine was hand cranked. And if you don't, if you aren't careful with that, it'll break your arm. So to make it a lot more reliable and easier to use, he's going to put batteries and electric motor in it. I mentioned, gee, it's too bad it doesn't have the sound of a Model T. And he said he may put a speaker behind the radiator. And these days, like DCC on your model locomotives, you can get any sound you want coming out of this thing. So the South Park Zephyr will live again. Uh, this V1 half symbol on the front of it was kind of a joke that they did because all of the Model T's had these flathead Fords and in 1938 Ford had just come out with a flathead V8. What a modern you know, invention that was. So jokingly they called it one half of a V engine. And here it is again in the Como yards behind the roundhouse. Caboose 1008. Boy, what a story this thing has. Um, it ended its career in Leadville when uh, it was still running between Fremont Pass at the Climax Mine down to Leadville. And then of course they standard gauge it in 1943 during the war. So it sat in the Leadville yards for many years. We do have a color photograph of the body on the ground in 1958. Beyond that, we don't know what happened to it. But Richard Farmer in Northridge, California got an interesting phone call one day from a realtor friend of his. And over in nearby Pasadena, uh, this was in the backyard of somebody. The gentleman had passed away and the family was selling the property. And he asked Richard, who, who he knew was interested in trains, to go look at it and tell me what you think and see if you want it. I got to get rid of this thing. So Richard drove over there. He thought it would be an old Southern Pacific wooden box or a caboose. And his eyes almost popped out when he recognized the body as a Colorado and Southern went inside, saw the number painted above the door. And he said, I want it. So he took it home, put it in his backyard. And he and his brother, Bob Farmer, who lives incredibly in Phoenix and commutes a lot to Northridge, just outside of LA, to help him work on this thing, they decided to do an operational restoration on this thing. Here's a picture of it in the late 30s in Como. This is 1008. Another interesting thing was that when they decided to do an operational restoration, they realized that the frame which they had hoped to use was a little too soft, a little too far gone to use for an operational restoration. So they took it apart, measured it, photographed it, and started building a new one. And when they were done with it, he called us up and said, hey, Bob, uh, this thing's in my backyard. My wife knows we're done with it. She says, get it out of here. I don't want to throw it away. Do you guys want it? So we flew out there, got a U-Haul truck, and drove it back to Como. And here it is as an artifact on display in the roundhouse. And you can see that, whoops, they fabricated some parts when they were still trying to use it, missing parts. Uh, but again, they came to the conclusion it's just too far gone. And here is the new one. What a difference. They are doing a Smithsonian level restoration on this thing. I gently asked him, what are you going to do with it when it's done? They are reassembling it as we speak. And he's a little reluctant to commit to anything. He's got his heart, soul, sweat, and a lot of his war chest involved in this thing. But he said, Como will see this car again. I don't know if it'll be kept there or uh, just visit Como, but Como will see this car again when it's done. And of course, we'll advertise that when we know it's coming, whether it's a short visit or 
in order to live there. He does want it to be available for visits to other railroads, certainly to Georgetown Loop, maybe the cats in the DNS. And I said, boy, whatever you guys want, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to that. So this beauty will be visiting Como again in the future. So here we are in 189, no, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this photo isn't that old, let's, let's fix that. There we go. This was taken in 2017, the first Boris Pass Railroad Day. This is the, on the Gunnison, Maine. And folks, that is the end. Uh, here's the websites for both the South Park Rail and uh, DSP and P organizations. Uh, feel free to click on those and lots of pictures, lots of information. And uh, I guess, Nathan, if you'll help me open this back up, I'm not sure what to click on now, but we'll open it up for questions. Can you hear me? I cannot hear you for some reason. Outstanding. Thank there. you. It helps if I unmute myself, Bob, <laughs> but I've unmuted folks. Um, I mean, if anybody's got questions, please feel free, unmute yourself, or, you know, I'd like to open it up to, you know, some of the, the South Park Rail Society guys, and of course, you know, Dr. Brannigan and Kathy, uh, if, if you have anything to share, by all means. Here's your chance to throw tomatoes at me. Yeah, not in this lifetime. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I like your background. Uh, I kind of grew. I kind of grew up with it. We got a question on the chat line there. Oh, uh, somebody asking, uh, which cars were used to transport ice? Good question. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, they used regular box cars, uh, mostly from the Maddox ice ponds there. And uh, they would just load them into regular box cars and haul them down to Denver. You sought us to insulate them. Um, there's lots of pictures of regular boxcars. Maybe they used a, a reefer, but um, I haven't seen any pictures of reefers being loaded with ice just for the sake of ice going down to Denver. Hey, Bob. Yes, sir. Will you, uh, will you have some volunteers working almost every Saturday in decent weather this summer and fall? If you go on either one of those websites, uh, our schedule is on there. Basically, it's every other Saturday. We used to do Saturday alternating with Sunday, but the traffic on 285 has gotten insane. And you yes. cannot make a lift out of uh, Como on the Highway 285 on a Sunday. Saturday's not too bad. Uh, but we are, we used to have a work week in early June with the virus. We postponed it and we rescheduled it as a mini work week starting tomorrow, half a week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And part of the reason we picked that is we figured there will be some people for whatever reason, didn't know or don't care or whatever, who will show up on what would have been Boreas Pass Railroad Day this Saturday. So we'll be there. Everything will be open. They can walk around and see things. But uh, we'll be working on various projects the next four days and actually next Saturday after that. And then we'll be every other Saturday through the end of September. Thanks, Bob. You've done an excellent job. Appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Bob, we thank you so much and everybody that's up there. I think all of us who have visited Como for many years, <laughs> when it was where it was and where it's come from, just um, it's incredible to go up there and see what's happened. Uh, stuff we never thought we'd ever see again. And, and you're continuing to push forward and, and uh, what a treasure for Colorado and the work you guys do. So 
Thank you. I'm still pinching myself that we've gotten this far and <laughs> continuing. And uh, I learned a few years ago to stop using the word never. It, it's, yeah. I don't know where this is going to end, but it's it's already blowing me away. It's just amazing what has happened, and we're just going to keep going. Yeah, we look forward to doing a, a club trip or some sort of club event up there next year. Yeah, absolutely. I want to be alone. One other question. Go ahead. I said one other question I had to go by that uh, for some of you Como folks. Um, does anybody know what the peak population of Como was? 500? Just over 400. Um, there are various, I think, inaccurate references out there. I've seen 800. I've seen a couple thousand. David here, who's done a lot of research on this town, thinks it was about 400. Around about 1,900. There was a peak population, just over 400. Nineteen hundred peak. There was just over a hundred people working in the roundhouse at the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's some great books about the uh, calling the engineers out, and engineers literally sleeping in their clothes in their front room, and then they get called out four hours later, and back over Fremont Pass, and there's a lot of. Uh, I think uh, warm thoughts about what railroading was like when we're driving our Jeeps in the summer, but it was quite <laughs> a job uh, when you were working there for, I think engineers made $5 a day or something like that. So, Any other questions for Bob? I had a couple items want to throw in. Sure, Pat, go for it. Um, I want to also note that uh, one thing uh, we've been working on is uh, artifacts and collections management. And uh, that's what uh, car 8020 or boxcar 8027 is now. So um, we have one of our volunteers, Catherine, who's uh, taken on that. And she's uh, cataloged oh, around four or 500 pictures with descriptions of all, because as we dig through the yards, we're finding so many other artifacts and this summer also uh, on one of the work days we found a new dump right in the back door of the hotel so she started uh, cataloging those also so uh, that's been a really uh, fun uh, project uh, along with all the track and everything else um, the pit restoration was amazing um, sitting there digging that mortar out of those rocks in the pit that was there in 1881, you know, it was put there. It was just amazing. The drum head, I just took a copy and made a, a blow up of it to create that drum head. And uh, that was really fun. Um, and then another thing that's just been fantastic are the people that show up at the Roundhouse and Depot with uh, ancestors from Como. Um, <laughs> Kay is George Camp Campion's grandfather. He was the one who uh, uh, approached me and said, Pat, I bought this bass drum. Do you think we can recreate the drum hand? I said, you bet, let's do it. <laughs> so that was how that came about. So all these people are showing up out of the woodwork, making donations, and and it's, it's just amazing. So just wanted to throw that out it's a lifelong dream come true for me and i thank everybody for everything that's been done thanks <laughs> thanks Pat. one other question i had has there been fire suppression put in the roundhouse or is there a plan to i mean i know we all hate to think about it but not yet um Eventually, when the water tank is built, we're planning to run a line and use the pressure from the tank. Um, and we'll probably have to do another well eventually, and we can tap off of that as well. Uh, we do not fire up the engine in the roundhouse. So that helps mitigate that, that possibility. Yeah. But at the moment, the answer is no. There's very little wood in the roundhouse. That's what? There's a stone building with a new oh, roof. The ceiling is all yeah. wood.
Any other questions from the audience? Uh, it's uh, Tim Bain here. I would like to add one more item here, if I could. Um, sure, absolutely. I know Bob mentioned the uh, box cars in Como there. Of course, he has showed the pictures of the Type 1 and the recently acquired Type 3 there. Just want to add that uh, so far as we know, there's only two examples of a Type 2 box car still in existence, and we recently acquired one of them, and it should be over in Como here uh, next month because they're planning to get it trucked over and moved over. Uh, Bob already showed you a picture of the uh, – the trucks that we bought out of South Dakota to go under that boxcar. And uh, we're presently making the uh, queen posts and some other parts of the bolsters that go underneath uh, with help from uh, funding from the Rocky Mountain Railway Club. So I wanna thank all your members and all your directors for the help and support of this project. Uh, couldn't have done it without you guys. Yeah, we're glad we could help. For us, it's, it's our pleasure. Thank yeah. you for the effort. Tim, is that car one of the ex-Victor Miller RGS cars? It actually is, yes. Um, if we ever can acquire the second one, we were kind of thinking about restoring it as an RGS car just because it is so original. But uh, both of them were the uh, Miller cars that, the, uh, CNS, that went from the CNS over to the RGS. What's the CNS number for that car? Uh, the CNS car is 8179. Hmm. The CNS number? Correct. 8179? That is correct. 8179, yes. Where Where did you find these cars? Uh, out uh, not too far from Montrose, actually. They uh, obviously were bought out of our rig at the uh, end of the RGS days and a few of them got scattered around there were originally three of these cars out there one got burnt not that long ago actually the uh, one that we just acquired the owner of the car uh, managed to pick up all the hardware off of the burnt car so we're not only getting one of the box cars we're also getting a lot of the door hardware and and uh, handrails as well from the uh, burnt car as well so we'll have some spare parts around cool it's great. Oh, you can be optimistic and scratch build a car. <laughs> well, it, we have enough for now. Car, like Bob said, we got to <laughs> play. One other question that came through is 4319 the only surviving CNS gone, or are there others around? That's kind of a tricky question. As far as we know, it's the only complete one around. There are rumors of uh, some of them being buried on a uh, as a riprap up in Wyoming. Um, we have yet to confirm that rumor, but uh, one of our friends up there in Cheyenne is sure that they're up there, and he has sent some pictures. That you can only really see wood sticking out from under the dirt, but uh, he says they're there. So at some time in the future, we hope to maybe go on another expedition and see what we can find up there. Well, we hope this uh, sort of works for everybody. It's not quite the same as getting to uh, meet in person, but then again, you get to sit on your own couch and you can drink whatever you want to drink, which we don't usually get to do. So we look for these little trade-offs where we can. Uh, this way people get to uh, join in from farther away than they typically would. Last month, we did have one of our uh, members from Australia was able to tune in. I don't know who's our long distance award winner tonight. Probably uh, Jerry in North Carolina, but, uh, and no, I see Australia, Linda in Texas, Australia, so hopefully you're yeah. staying cool, Linda. Australia oh. is here. Hey, John. <laughs> hey, hey, John. <laughs> I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed the presentation, I must say. Thank you. See, you're Thank the silver you. lining, John. You're the silver lining. <laughs> what time is it there, John? Um, five to one in the afternoon on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so tomorrow will come. <laughs> <laughs> this is now the tea time Rocky Club meetings. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, I really, I really appreciate it because it it allows me to to uh, take part. Uh, thousand miles is a bit much to drive for one night thing. Yeah, it is. 
Exactly. Tell, tell us where you are. I'm in Wisconsin. Okay. Wisconsin. All right. Well, like I mentioned earlier, right. next month, uh, next month's meeting uh, will feature some uh, Northwest Montana standard gauge, Great Northern or former Great Northern. So, uh, I guess if uh, if everybody's kind of run out of questions, we could probably wrap it up and let you get back to the other couch cushion now. <laughs> so I will add one other thing. Next month, we shouldn't have to go through the whole sign up process again. Um, Next month, the plan is just to make it a live YouTube stream. This month was a bit of a test for that. Um, best I can tell it's working, but I won't really know until we wrap the meeting up and I can go back through the video. So I watched it on YouTube and it was fine. Oh, did, uh, uh, excellent. Nathan, did you happen to see how many people might have been watching on YouTube? Uh, the highest I saw over there was about 35. And there were about 45 in the Zoom meeting. So wow. pushing record attendance for a, rock, a regular Rocky Club meeting lately. Indeed. That's the highest we've had since we had a visit from Ed Dickens. Yeah. <laughs> we sure appreciate the presentation um, and uh, look forward to, uh, to, uh, to the future and it growing. So. Thank you keep all. August, Appreciate keep it. August twenty first in mind for next year. That's our uh, Boys Pass Railroad Day again, third Saturday in August. Great concert, great locomotive, great train rides. All right. Yeah. Thanks. We'll Bob. be sure to help publicize Thank it. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.